back to Entrepreneurship Tuesday. And uh, in this particular session, we look at an interesting conversation. We're looking at entrepreneurship abroad. In studio, I'm joined with Ilian Katiko. He's uh, uh, Illinois uh, Department of Human Service. He provides access to government uh, uh, resources, including health care and nutrition to people who actually need them. So. Um, he has, uh, he's also equally experienced uh, in different fields from interior design and nonprofits and pharmaceuticals. Welcome, Ian. Oh, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on your show. Karibu. <laughs> Asante. Karibu, right? Yes, near <laughs> Jua. <laughs> so, uh, where is Ian uh, Katiku born and bred? Okay, so I was born here, I was born in Ukambani in uh, Mitaboni, mm -hmm. and that's where I spent the most of, majority of my youth, mm -hmm. um, herding cattle, you know, spending time in the countryside. Um, but when I was about e eight years old, I relocated to the United States, and I've lived in Chicago since. Oh, you actually did get to spend time in, in is it in Kitui? Um, no, it's in uh, near Machakos. Near Machakos, yeah. okay. So mm -hmm. how was your life growing up? You know, the younger Ian, if the young Ian was told like a decade or two decades mm. uh, down down the road that he will be a historian, stroke a philosopher, uh, would you believe that? No, you know, I actually wanted to be a, a scientist uh, when I was younger, um, or work in finance or something like that. But when I when I got to university. Um, even though I told myself I was still uh, pursuing a finance career, I noticed that all of my courses were centered on history and philosophy. So mm -hmm. it kind of uh, found me and, and took over um, organically in that way. Mm -hmm. You relocated at the age of eight years, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so did you experience uh, cultural, but then but that we were very young, I, I don't really think you experienced any cultural shock, did you? I did. Oh. I, I really did because um, my life in Kenya was actually um, very rural. Okay. Um, I spent a lot of my time herding cows, spending time in the countryside, and uh, the skills that I learned um, as a student uh, in Rwai and in the r more rural parts of Kenya in that time um, didn't really apply to anything that I needed in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, you know, telling time with my shadow or how to uh, get poison out from a snake bite suddenly wasn't relevant and I had to learn new skills, uh, like l how to ride a bike while avoiding cars in the street or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a big shock, but I feel like there's a nice um, synergy now as an adult between the skills and the personality I developed here at home mm -hmm. and uh, the mindset that, you know, you develop somewhere like Chicago. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Take me through your passion and interest in interior design. When did it all start and how far did you go with it? Okay, yes, I was looking for a job uh, outside of uh, college um, when uh, I met this lady, her name is Sherry Bolton, who was starting an interior de design company. And so she invited me to sort of uh, come in at the first level and at the beginning uh, it was just the two of us. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would accompany, I was more or less her apprentice, so I would accompany her on her projects and, um, you know, she would, we would work and workshop together on sort of what uh, worked in what kind of space from um, commercial buildings to private homes. Um, and it, it sort of, the interior design aspect of it was, was really um, engaging and beautiful, but the interesting part for me was um, assisting in building this business from the ground up. Yeah. Do you ever get interest to further it probably on this on the from the aspect of you studying something of your own? Oh, studying uh, design itself? Yeah. Um unfortunately with my background in philosophy yes. I think my, my interest sort of lay more in working in government, mm -hmm. thinking about policy okay. and affecting people's lives on that level. Mm -hmm. But I think the sort of um, attention to detail that I that I uh, developed while working in inter interior design, mm -hmm. um, I think I'll, I'll still carry that with me forward. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So if anyone who, uh, who is looking for an interior designer, they can ch check out Ian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. So take us through uh, what you do uh, at the Department of uh, Human Service in Illinois. So what do you exactly do you do there? Okay, so the, the majority of my work um, involves assessing budgets mm -hmm. and determining uh, sort of uh, what government programs work best for different citizens. And I'm sort of focused on um, citizens in the, in the later parts of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and unfortunately what I've, what I've realized is that not many people, and it's very, very rare that people can afford to support themselves once they're no longer able to work. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully in the United States there are a lot of, um, gov there's a lot of government assistance for people um, after the age of 64. Mm -hmm. So um, I assess their estate and their, their finances and all of their assets and sort of uh, decide uh, how, how much and when the government should step into a system if they need long-term care or um, support in their home if, if they have their own place mm -hmm. to stay. Yeah. The culture is quite different compared to us here because here there's also the aspect of black tax mm -hmm. back home whereby mm -hmm. uh, as a child it, oh, it's a responsibility for you to take care of your parents. But mm -hmm. In US it's the other way around. Like your elderly parents they are taken to homes where they're taken care of. Mm -hmm. Probably could take us to that perspective of what that shift of a dangle difference. That's actually something that's been uh, of great interest to me, actually of, of great concern, um, because the trend that I've been seeing, at least mm -hmm. in my generation and the generation uh, coming after, is that people are having fewer and fewer children. I know mm -hmm. my, my parents' generation, um, her mother had six children, mm -hmm. and so I have plenty of cousins, and, and the family's very big, and my grandmother's well supported, because she's got all these people, and this, this land, this home where she can go, and spend uh, her, her elderly uh, years. Um, but in my mother's case, she's only got me and my brother. Mm -hmm. In my case, I might only have one child. And so the, the responsibility for taking care of, you know, myself when I'm elderly is mm -hmm. going to be much heavier for my child than it is for, say, my mother. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's sort of what goes into the dynamic we see in the United States where the government becomes a larger player in elderly care. Um, and I'd be interested to see what the, what the forecast is for Kenya in terms of, I guess, our generation when we get to that stage and we only have uh, one or two children uh, working, living their lives, paying rent. And <laughs> yeah, it's such a difference. Yeah. And uh, Ian, you having your hands on when it comes to back when you are doing interior design mm. and your experience there, mm. would you say that living and learning abroad makes, makes you a better entrepreneur? Um, I guess you know it depends. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's the there's a certain environment in which uh, you, you have to develop your skills. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how transferable those skills are to say somewhere like Kenya. That's something I've been interested in for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, is on the aspect of opportunities. Yeah, there, it, there's a sort of a mindset in mm -hmm. the United States that's called a, a grind set. Mm -hmm. And I know that in, in Kenya that it's, there's something like that. It's called juokali. You mm -hmm. know, you do do yes. what you can with what you have. Yes. Um, so. Yeah, I, f I feel like uh, m not not simply living, working abroad, but managing the transition, being adaptable, learning a new lang a new way of using even the same language, you know, um, and a new culture, being always open and attentive to sort of uh, changes in your environment and your social dynamics. Um, that's the sort of perspective that I think a good entrepreneur needs to have. Mm -hmm. How easy is it to just uh, a transition from, you know, from here mm. and going to another country and just starting something new, how how acceptable will you be like in terms of uh, just starting somewhere uh, where you were not born and, bro and, and bred? Well, it's difficult because um, entre entrepreneurship sort of requires um, strong networks and support, not only in terms of finances, being able to get a, a, a loan, being trustworthy in that way, mm -hmm. but also um, support from your family. You know, you need to have uh, people who make it possible in case you're not ma you're not earning profits for a long time, mm -hmm. or you're not able to, uh, to, to 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 work a normal nine to five job because you're focused on building your business. And so I think that's the the main difficulty that sort of comes from um, d divorcing yourself from mm -hmm. your support network mm -hmm. in somewhere like Kenya, and then starting over in a continent where you might only have one or two family members. Oh. Yeah. Let's speak to us about originality and just how to study the competition, uh, both past and actually present. In the well, industry someone might be interested in. Well, I definitely think originality is important, um, but I think finding a gap, finding a need in a place is is almost more important. You know, because well, it's a solver problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can take what others have done. You can you can learn from them and 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 see what works. Um, but if you find a place where it hasn't been applied, um, that's that's sort of where you need to plug yourself in. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Speak to us about the challenges or when it comes to even even before you get into challenges, let's talk about the cultural shock and how to actually even maneuver that. Mm. We have uh, so many uh, entrepreneurs in terms of even if you're ch shifting or transitioning careers, mm. uh, moving uh, abroad. Speak to us on how you cope your uh, cultural uh, sh uh, shock situations and moments. Even I'm sure you have friends mm. who have also uh, experienced the same. Just a couple of ways just to cap to cap to cap that situation. Okay. Well, I think what's one one area where I failed in terms of curbing my cultural shock mm -hmm. was uh, retaining my language. Uh -huh. You know, because the transition, okay. the change, the adaptation. I think mm -hmm. that's very natural, and it's going to happen whether you want it or not. I didn't choose for my accent to change and the way that I dress to change, mm -hmm. but those things sort of start. Uh, you know, they're they're forces that act on you rather than than choices that you make. Mm -hmm. um, but one choice that you sort of you should make for your for your mental health and well-being is to retain um, what's important to you about the, your mother culture, mm -hmm. um, which I, which unfortunately for me was you know my language, you know um, knowledge of even the geography of where I'm from and everything mm -hmm. like that. That that allows you to to move back to the place that sort of um, grew you or built you, and to still feel at home, still be able to converse in a normal way with a with your family. Mm -hmm. Speak to us about how important it is just to build a new network, mm. just put yourself out there and go up to the opportunities that you want. Yeah, yeah. Bu building new networks um, is definitely important, but one thing to note about that is that um, networks that you build in that sort of um, artificial way, I think uh, Max Weber called them sort of weak relationships. Okay. They're very useful for business, very mm -hmm. um, useful in terms of codependency. Um, but th those aren't networks that you can sort of fall back on mm -hmm. when you're experiencing difficulty. So I think a hybrid of um, networks that are sort of inbuilt, that you were sort of born with, or family ties, mm -hmm. um, and uh, networks that you make through, ne through um, networking, I guess, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word, yeah. at, at, at uh, fairs and, and, and at school. Mm -hmm. um, I think integrating those two sort of networks together is what makes a really effective intro entrepreneur. Right, uh, and I'm not sure about this, but you'll let me know about how important it is to just generally be interested in the in the country that you'll be relocating to and starting something, starting a business that is, and just generally being uh, involved in the culture and just living like the locals. Mm. Yeah. Well, okay, I think maybe for Kenyans, for mm -hmm. people like us, it it's a good thing that somewhere like America already has uh, a large black population that's been there from the beginning. Okay. And so when it comes to integrating somewhere like that, you already kind of have a family in a way. Um, but if you're deciding to go somewhere where you'll truly be alone or an outsider, that's, that's really something that you ought to consi consider. How easy will it be for me to learn the language if they don't speak it there, or to integrate, even, even if, I, if I speak perfectly like them, or dress like them, or do all those things, will I really be seen as part of this place? Mm -hmm. you know, can I really be considered a trustworthy or a full citizen here? And uh, I think that, that not only for your, for your own health, but also in terms of your success and how far you can go, uh, these are the most important things to consider when you're thinking about starting a business somewhere. All right, let's look at uh, localizing. Like, how can someone just localize the idea? They're coming from a different place, mm. and they're just, you know, uh, in this new space. Mm. So, how can they localize the idea, vision, and also expectation? And how important is it to just to get a mentor, or mm. if you're fortunate enough, an angel investor as well? Okay. Yeah, I think. Um, the, the process of immigration and, and cultural adaptation will sort of make you aware of the gaps in terms of the differences between where you came from and where you are. Um, so that that's a sort of inroad into understanding uh, the local needs of the area. But you also need to understand, like, do, do, the, do your own due diligence in terms of understanding the differences in policy and law and, and, and how you even start and organize a business. And I think that's where mentorship is really key. Mm -hmm. If you have someone who lives there, like, like I did with Sherry, Sherry Bolton, who can sort of walk you through the, the process of, uh, you know, 
wh how many, wh how, which, how should, which lawyer should you talk to in terms of like how to start a business and how do you file your taxes and, and do all these sort of nitty gritty things where if you had forgotten or something had sort of slipped through the cracks, uh, you might end up in a lot of tr uh, trouble <laughs> with the IRS or something like that. Um, so I think that's, that's the bulk of it. And in terms of uh, finding an angel investor, I think uh, knowing what a trustworthy business looks like where you are, I think is sort of the most essential thing in terms of finding investors. Mm -hmm. um, luckily for me, I, I was Sherry Bolton, you know, she was there. Uh, she had her networks and that's how we got investment into the company that we were working with. So it might be a lot more difficult to sort of, if you're doing it all on your own. Okay, all right. And from where you see and also your experiences, how is it just to shift and just start all new in, in a country that you know less of? It's, it's very difficult. And in mm -hmm. fact, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> you wouldn't recommend no. it? <laughs> It's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. most people move to where they have family or move to where they have friends, mm -hmm. move to somewhere they speak the language. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very, it's not advised. And um, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of, a lot of Kenyans struggle and um, fall by the wayside. Uh, when, when they end up, something, you can end up being taken advantage of mm -hmm. very badly if you mm -hmm. go somewhere where you mm -hmm. have no networks. All right couple of challenges that uh, anyone who wants to transition should expect. Okay, well... Or what you actually, the couple of challenges that you went through. Okay, well, yeah, the, the difficulty, I think, and I don't know if that's so much the case anymore, mm -hmm. is um, sort of maintaining your, your pride and dignity in a place where your values are not the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, what what you considered most important to like how, how you treat people and how you expect to be treated um, yeah these things aren't the same everywhere mm -hmm. and and you have to accept that you're going to be an outsider if you go somewhere drastically different from where you grew up mm -hmm. uh, you might not be so much of an outsider if you go uh, maybe to nearby Tanzania where people speak the same language and you might even have people with your same mother tongue there um, but the the ethics, the values, even the religion, um, your notion, notions of what makes up an identity, um, you have to sort of do, do some give and take mm -hmm. um, when you go somewhere new. Oh, and what are the methods that you, uh, you used to just promote the business when, when you talk about interior design mm -hmm. and your partner? So what are a couple of methods that you used to just promote your business? Uh, we used a lot of social media, mm -hmm. right? We had a social media account, which I was in charge of at the very, very beginning when it was just the two of us, where we would uh, post our work, um, show people sort of the designs that we were working with, and every mm -hmm. time we had a new project, uh, we would, you know, po po popularize that and publicize it. Um, and there was also um, a, a brand creation sort of strategy that you can use with social media where you talk about yourself as a person, okay. you know? Um, and you try to you try to reach a group of people that might want to interact with you simply on the basis of your personality, mm -hmm. and that I think um, a lot of business relationships in the United States. I'm not sure how it is here, are very informal. They mimic um, personal friendships. You know, mm -hmm. you speak to people with their first name. You you know you act as if you're <laughs> friends, even though you might just be you know clients or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where the social media aspect of of marketing sort of comes in. You have to be someone people want to be friends with. All right. Let me take you back to now Illinois Department of Human Service mm -hmm. and find out what's your favorite thing about working in that particular space. Well, it's incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when a family uh, calls me and they don't know what to do about elderly care mm -hmm. and they've they've they don't know how to manage the bureaucracy um, being able to to effectively sort of ease their stress mm -hmm. and let them know that everything will be fine you know mm -hmm. that there are resources there is an, a framework in place mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, their elderly parent has a place to stay and that they have food and they have water and they have shelter mm -hmm. you know that, that that I think is sort of 
why I <laughs> why I do the work I do. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So I just found out that you and uh, Ken were classmates once upon a time. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> met at Columbia doing philosophy, actually. Okay. It's a great passion. Right. We were in Masai Mara uh -huh. arguing about uh, the f future of AI and, uh -huh. uh, you know, labor uh -huh. and politics and... Uh -huh. All, all these lessons that we learned. All right, I will ask you the same question I asked him. Mm. What do you do during your free time if you're not busy uh, at work? Oh, I, I, I'm a light risk taker, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, like I said, I grew up in the countryside, so yes. I like just ranging into the wilderness off mm -hmm. the beaten path, mm -hmm. uh, doing my own sort of safaris in Illinois. Okay. <laughs> and also so more adventurous person. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So how can people reach out to you on social media if they want to know more about Ian and just catch up with Ian Katiku? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter as well. I'm on mm -hmm. at Ian Katiku mm -hmm. um, on Twitter. So feel free to reach out. All right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ian Katu, for creating time to be with us on this particular yeah, session. Thank you for having me. Looking at entrepreneurship abroad. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, guys, that's our time frame. Remember, we do this every single Monday to Friday. Time frame is usually 7 till 10 a.m. Why in the morning? For now, I want to bid you goodbye. My name is Michelle Ashira. You can follow me across all my social media handles. That is at Michelle Ashira. At Y254 channel is where you can find us across all our social. At Rama Guko is where you can find him on his social. For now, enjoy the rest of your program. You're right here on Y254 channel and have a lovely day.